11 to 9 with Jesse Egbert and, and Daniel Keller, title Reconceptualize and Register in a Continuous Situational Space. So the background is, is the view that, that I've been developing, especially with uh, work with Susan Conrad on the components of, of traditional register analyses, corpus-based register analyses, where it has three major components. The one is the this analysis of the situational context. So these are non-linguistic characteristics of that specific situation. And then as a separate analysis, analysis of linguistic characteristics and especially quantitative rates of occurrence for, for different linguistic features. And the claim is that there's a systematic relationship between the situational context and the linguistic characteristics. It's not just arbitrary. So the mediating factor is what I refer to as, as functions, computer functions. And the idea here is that linguistic features are not simply indexical. So they don't simply happen to occur with a particular register, but rather there's this functional, underlying functional motivation for why the linguistic features that you do find in the register are necessarily the ones that should be there because of they, they serve communicative functions. And so the point of this talk is that there are, are a number of methodological and theoretical issues that are often neglected in corpus studies of register variation. So the kind of the idea of doing a register analysis is that you start with the situational analysis, you have to describe the register situationally, but that's often been done in a pretty cursory manner. So, so without a lot of uh, detail and without a lot of evidence to support the situational analysis. And in particular, individual texts have not been analyzed for the situational characteristics. And so instead, what you find are just overall global analyses of the registers. Second is that before the situational analysis, the, 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 the methodology for classifying each text into a register category is not articulated. So this step has kind of been overlooked or, or been taken to be obvious. And even before that, there's a prior step and that's figuring out, well, what are the possible register categories that occur in a discourse domain? And here again, this has just kind of been taken for granted that we know what the register categories are. And then we put texts into those categories without giving evidence to support what the categories are. So these are challenges, not just for, for register analyses, but for virtually all corpus construction and corpus analysis projects. So that is figuring out what are the text categories in the corpus? How do we know those are valid categories? And then figuring out what category does each text belong to? So the specific background for, for the, the first major project that I'm gonna talk about today is an analysis of register variation on the searchable web. And this was a, 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 an NSF funded project uh, that I did together with Mark Davies and Jesse Egbert. Uh, the, the linguistic analyses uh, collaborating with, with Jesse Egbert, resulting in a number of articles and then a book called Register Variation Online. And the goals of the project were to compare the linguistic characteristics of web registers. And this is based on a near random sample of 48,000 documents from across the spectrum of the searchable web. And then second, to interpret the linguistic patterns of variation relative to the situational and communicative characteristics of web registers. So for the project, we, we focused that we refer to as the core corpus, standing for the corpus of online registers of English. And as I said, this is based on a near random sample of web documents. And what we were hoping to do was to get a random sample from across the spectrum of the web. So totally disregarding any possible register categories with the goal of proportionally representing the kinds of text that actually existed on the searchable web. And so our method to try to achieve this was that we, we first carried out Google searches using uh, the, the, the search items were these highly frequent three, three grams, 
and by being high, highly frequent, most of them are function words. So what we tried to avoid were any content words because we wanted to, to not have Google steer us in, in the direction of some content domain, but just to search the entire web as much as possible. So these are three grams like is not the and, and from the. And then we, we searched very deeply. And uh, I mean, we, we took hits uh, going very deep for any one of these searches using 800 to 1,000 links for each of the end grams. So these would be 80 to 100 pages of Google results. And again, the idea was that by going deep, we would try to get past the biases that Google would build in where, where Google would think it knew what we wanted. We were hoping that Google would give up on that after the first couple pages of hits. And so we just wanted to get as much as possible a random sample of documents from the web. So the total corpus uh, included 48,500 documents, about 58 million words. So as I said, the documents were not coded for registering. So the register was not at all a consideration in constructing the corpus. So given that our goals on the project were to analyze register variation on the web, our first challenge was to figure out what are the register categories for each because we had two major challenges. One of those was that most web documents don't have any external indicators of what the registered category is. So, it's, so they're just kind of, you know, you do a search and you get documents and it doesn't tell you what the register is. And a second challenge is that there's in fact almost no agreement among researchers on the set of possible register categories. So we didn't even know what, what the possible categories were. So our solution, we developed our own hierarchical framework and we tried to code situational characteristics at the outset rather than to point directly to coding a register category. And by doing this, raters were able to achieve higher levels of, of reliability in coding these situational characteristics, which eventually would lead them to one of the possible register categories that, that we uh, we allowed them to, to code a document as belonging to. So we used four raters for each document. So all of the, 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 uh, the documents in our corpus were coded by four different raters for all of these different situational characteristics. So this is the coding framework, and this is a hierarchical framework. So coders, for example, at the, at the top level, they had to decide if the document was spoken in a written mode, and then if it was written mode, they had to decide was it interactive or not interactive. And then for the non-interactive written text, they had to decide communicative purposes. So narratives, informational descriptions, overt opinions, persuasion, how-to procedures, and lyrical. And then with finally under those, then they had sub-registers that they could use. So there are there are uh, lots of linguistic descriptions based on that coding. The most detailed is in the book that, that I did with Jesse Egbert in 2018. But when we got to the end of the project, we felt that there were some important limitations of what we had done. So one was that the situational parameters were treated as simple dichotomies, either yes or no, it belonged to that situational characteristic. And the registers were treated as discrete, clearly delimited categories. So with our rubric, our, our, our coding framework, coders were forced to treat text as belonging to one and only one category. But when we actually then did our linguistic analyses, we were discovering different patterns. So we discovered that there were often important differences in situational characteristics among the texts within one of these register categories, and that some texts were better analyzed as belonging to a hybrid register. So that's what led to the present study that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, what, what I hope to do is explore the possibility of continuous situational parameters, so rather than discrete situational characteristics, the possibility that registers are not necessarily well delimited with respect to situational characteristics, so that the possibility that individual texts within a registers, within a single register, might be quite different in its situational characteristics. The possibility that individual texts can have hybrid situational characteristics 
And then finally, this will lead to bottom-up textual analyses of, of categories that are well-defined situationally, and I refer to these as situational techniques. So the steps in the study, I'm, uh, I'll be describing text and registers in a continuous quantitative space of situational variation, and I'll apply model dimensional analysis for this purpose, as you'll see in a minute. And then I'll utilize those dimensions to describe situational characteristics of X and these predetermined register categories, leading eventually to these other categories, what I refer to as situational text. And then what I hope to do is to compare the, the discourse descriptions that we achieve from the traditional register approach to the situational text type approach. So the corpus for this second study was based on a sample from the bigger core corpus. And so we chose a thousand, I, I can't even remember how we ended up with these two extra documents, but it was a thousand and two documents that we randomly selected from the core corpus. And then you can see here five major steps in the analysis. And I'll be going through each of these steps and I'll keep on bringing back the slides so you can see what step we're on as I go through the analysis. So I'm going to begin first step coding each text. So each individual text was coded for a set of continuous situational parameters. So this is what the, the corpus looks like, this baby core. And proportionally, the categories in baby core, the register categories, are proportionally a mirror of, of the proportions in the bigger core corpus. So for example, news was the, the largest category that, that came out of our original uh, sample from the lab in the core corpus and so on. You can see these categories. So these are the, the predetermined register categories coming from our, our original research project. And so then each one of those texts, so each of those thousand texts in baby core was coded for 23 different situational parameters. And these situational parameters were coded as continuous scales. So each text, now not only was it coded for multiple parameters, but each of those parameters was itself a, a quantitative parameter, so it could exist to a greater or lesser than extent. So even something like the text is a spoken transcript, it could be considered a spoken transcript to some extent on a one to six scale. The, the author speaker is an expert, so the reader would, would code that to, of the extent to which the author speaker was an expert and so on for these 23 different parameters. All of the texts were coded by two different readers. And then we did correlations just between the two ratings to see how, to what extent were readers agreeing. And we got modest, you know, modest agreement, not, not strong, but not horrible. Cohen's Kappa in the range 0.3 to 0.7 for, for 20 of the 23 parameters. This was, you know, we treated this as basically pilot research to see if the approach was going to work and what could we find out about situational variation through this approach. And so we just went with this rather than going back and revising our rubric to try to achieve higher levels of agreement. And so then we took the, the ratings from the two coders and we averaged those, <coughs> excuse me, for all of the, the subsequent analysis. So the second step in the analysis was to try to identify situational parameters of variation. And the method I used here was analogous to traditional motor dimensional analysis, where the idea is that situational characteristics will co-occur in texts. So in this case, we had a 23 different characteristics. And the underlying idea was that those 23 characteristics will co-occur in different ways in text if you look across all of the texts of the corpus. And so the goal here is to identify underlying dimensions, but in this case, these are going to be underlying situational dimensions of variation. <clears throat> so the same rationale, basically the same methods as other model dimensional analyses. As I just said, the goal identifying these underlying parameters of situational dimensions. <clears throat> So we chose, we used the statistical technique of factor analysis for, for this purpose. We chose a solution with two factors, 
based on just an examination of the scree plot and, and the interpretability of the, of the dimensions. And I'm just going to briefly go through the, the interpretation of each of these two dimensions. And this is, this is very much similar to, to traditional multidimensional analyses. But in this case, the co-occurring features are situational characteristics. So this first dimension we interpreted as personal opinionated discourse versus technical information supported with evidence. And you can see at the top here, the, the one group of co-occurring situational features, these are the ones that have positive loadings. These are one having to do with interactive text, uh, text where the author is focusing on self or giving personal information about self. The purpose is persuasion, entertainment, giving advice and recommendations, and then especially expressing opinion. And the basis of information is especially opinion and personal experience. And so that's one set of co-occurring situational characteristics. And that's opposed to a complementary set of co-occurring situational characteristics. So having to do with technical information supported with evidence. So the text is pre-planned and edited. The author is an expert. The purpose is, is, is to explain information, and the basis of that information is factual scientific evidence. So you can see these are two opposing sets of situational characteristics. And then there's a second parameter, the second dimension, which we interpreted as narrative entertaining discourse versus other communicative purposes. So basically, this dimension is narration, and, and especially entertaining narration, as opposed to everything else. You know, purposes. So the, the set of situational characteristics having positive loadings as to mention, the text is spoken, lyrical, artistic, the author assumes cultural social knowledge, the purpose is narrating past events and narrating and entertaining the reader, and the basis of information to the extent there is a basis of information that's identified here is direct quotes. And these are opposed to explaining information, giving advice and recommendations, providing how-to instructions. So basically, all the other communicative purposes. Okay, so after doing that step, we have these two parameters, what we're, I'm gonna to refer to as these two situational dimensions. And we can now use those, those dimensions to compare the situational characteristics of predetermined registers. And the first step for doing that is to compute a dimension, dimension scores for each individual text. So we can describe each web document with respect to these two situational dimensions. So here's an example of a news report. This particular news report had a negative score on dimension one, which means that the situational characteristics were written and edited and informational and it had a, a large positive score in dimension two, meaning that the situational characteristics were narrative, entertaining, and assuming social background. And I'm not gonna read through the text, but you can see it kind of, this, this text does combine those two things, that even though it's a written and edited and therefore informational news report, it's at the same time giving an account of these things that happened in the past with you know, these, these entertaining, you know, kind of a, an ultimate goal of providing entertainment to the reader. Okay, so once we've computed these dimension scores for each text, then we can look at the extent to which different registers, these predetermined registers, differ from one another situationally, and the extent to which there's variation within a register among the texts that belong to that register. So just to show you some examples, here are four, I'm plotting here, four registers with respect to the two dimensions. So dimension one is the horizontal axis with technical information at the left-hand side, personal opinion on the right-hand side. And then dimension two is the vertical axis with narrative communicative purposes at, at, up at the top there and advice and procedural communicative purposes down at the bottom of the chart. And what you can see is that these registers are relatively well delimited. 
So especially the red one, which is for encyclopedia articles, it's a very tight group. Each of those dots represents one document, and it shows the, the dimension scores for that particular document. So you can see encyclopedia articles are very tight. You know, so most encyclopedia articles have very similar, similar situational characteristics along these two dimensions. The green ones are for song lyrics, and you can see song lyrics, although there aren't very many of them, but it's also relatively small. The dark blue ones are for personal blogs. You know, it's somewhat more scattered, but, but still relatively delimited. And then the how-to documents being spread over a wider range of, of variation with respect to those two dimensions. But those can be then contrasted with, with other registers where there's even more variation, so it's even less well delimited. So at one extreme, if we look at the green dots here, these are for documents that were categorized as opinion blogs. And you can see the situational characteristics of opinion blogs can basically be anything. That, that, this, that the situational characterizations don't delimit the text that go into that register category. A similar uh, case arises for interactive discussions. So if you look at the these kind of red dots and how they're spread across the, the whole chart. Interestingly, even news reports, so we kind of think of news reports as being a relatively well delimited register, but you can see here that news reports have situational characteristics in all four of these quadrants. So there's, there's a very large range of variation within news. So this then led us to, to try an alternative methodological approach resulting in what we call situational text types. And the idea of this alternative approach is to apply a statistical technique known as cluster analysis to identify groupings of texts that are situationally well-defined. And so the way cluster analysis works is that it looks at the scores for each individual text, and then it groups those texts into, into categories, new categories, that are maximally distinguished from one another. So there are two, two kind of statistical characteristics of this grouping. The one is that the texts within a category will be maximally similar to one another. And at the same time, the categories or the clusters will be maximally distinguished. And so we're coming up with these new categories having nothing to do with registers. So cutting directly across the registers to group texts into these clusters that are, that are maximally well-defined with respect to the situational characteristics. And this is an approach I've used before, uh, several times based on linguistic dimensions, but not based on these situational dimensions. So this is just the, the tree diagram for the cluster analysis. It really doesn't tell you anything except that for the, the texts can be grouped into clusters. But this is a much more informative display. So I'm going to go back a slide now. So this is back to the tree, di tree diagram. And so what happens with this cluster analysis is that you can actually cut the tree at, at any level. So you can come up with, with any number of clusters and actually compare hierarchically what happens with the groupings as you go from, from one number of clusters to a larger number of clusters. So to illustrate that, this is what the three cluster solution looks like, with just these three colors. And if you, for example, look at the, the yellow-orange ones in the upper left, if I go to the five cluster solution, you can see that the yellow-orange cluster in the three cluster solution is split into two different clusters. And the same thing happens Here's the three cluster solution again. So if you look at that red cluster, which is very large down at the bottom part of the graph, in the five cluster solution, that then gets split into two different clusters. And you can you know, kind of compare the characteristics of the clusters with these different hierarchical uh, organizations, you know, cutting the tree at different places. For the rest of the talk today, I'm just gonna focus on the five cluster solution. Okay, so finally, what does it tell us? So, so what, what is that five cluster solution? What are these situational text types? 
and how does it compare to traditional register distinctions? Well, we can do this from either side. We, we can start with the situational text types and, and ask the question, what are the registers of the documents that are in those text types? And that's what this chart shows. And then in a minute, I'll show you the other side of the coin. So you can see that the clusters, these five situational text types, are not equally well-defined in terms of the registers in them. So at one extreme, uh, something, well, let's take cluster 2.2, which is the most extreme, that that cluster, most of the documents that were grouped in that cluster were encyclopedia articles. So, so that's the, the one situational text type that has the greatest correspondence to a particular register. Where in contrast, if we take a, a cluster or like cluster 1.1.1 or cluster 1.2, both of those clusters consist of documents from many different registers. And this becomes clearer if we look at, at this, this distribution from the other side. So if we start from the registers and ask which clusters, which situational text types were those registers grouped into. So some of the registers were grouped mostly into a single situational text type. So for example, encyclopedia articles, most of them grouped into situational text type. Song lyrics, most of them in a single text type. Personal blogs, most of them in a single text type. But it's kind of interesting here that the text type that the, that the personal blogs are grouped into is the same text type that the song lyrics were grouped into. How to procedural, you know, not quite as smart, but, but basically only two situational text types for that register. In contrast, if we, we take um, a register like news reportage, we can see here that there are four major different situational text types that news reports were grouped into. The same thing occurs with opinion blogs. So the fact that, that these registers are spread across the, the situational dimensions. They have many, many different situational characteristics for the documents within those registers, corresponds to the fact that they're actually grouped into different situational text types. Okay, so I just wanna wrap up the, the discussion of, of these web registers with one particular application of the analysis that, that turns out to be especially useful. And this is the fact that that when we did our original study of web documents, it turned out that there were quite a number of documents that basically did not belong to any register category. And this is something that we really haven't talked about in, in register studies or, or in corpus linguistics. So if you think in corpus linguistics, you think of a normal corpus, every text in the corpus belongs to some category, it belongs to a register category. And there's no such thing as a text that doesn't have a register category. But if you go out in the real world, that actually happens, you know, it happens quite a bit where, where you encounter texts and you just don't know what is the register category of the text. And this especially happens on the web. So if you do a Google search and you get a document return that's got this information, a lot of the time, we don't have a clue what the register is for that document. It's just like this document that, that the search found. And so it, we, we have this document, but we don't know what the register category is. So here's an example where in the original study, the raters did not agree on the register category of this document. But now with, with this continuous situational framework, we're able to have a categorization of it. We're able to, to say, you know, what are the characteristics of this text? And so it, it turned out, and I didn't give the actual scores here, but, but this, uh, yeah, I deleted them, sorry. Uh, but this text turned out to have a, a, a large positive dimension one score, so marked for, for personal opinion, and a large dimension two score, so, so marked for the narrative communicative purpose. And you can see, as you go through the text, it basically starts off kind of like a news report. So, so basically kind of informational narration, reporting things that happen, 
and then clearly goes into personal opinion here at the end. And, and it's just kind of all morphed together. And if you look at the, the full document, you see much more of this kind of going back and forth between these two things, making it you know, fit this kind of a text that we don't really know what it is, but we can know in terms of what cluster it belongs to and what the situational characteristics are of this document. And there are lots of documents like this. Okay, so just quickly then I wanted to, to uh, kind of give you an overview of a second project that I'm working on, again with Jesse Egbert and Daniel Keller, and then also with Stacy White, where we're taking this same framework of continuous situational variation, but applying it to a different discourse domain. In, in this case, we're applying it to face-to-face -face conversation. And the research question here is, what, what goes on within a register category like face-to-face -face conversation, that's a very large general register category where we know that there's variation within the category, but we don't have any framework for analyzing that variation within the category. Is there a way that we can take this, this continuous situational framework and help us to make sense of the variation within the general register like conversation? So in this case, what we did is we started with each of the conversations uh, th this was based on the, the BNC spoke in 2014. <clears throat> we took each of the conversations in the corpus and we first segmented those into coherent discourse units. And then each of those discourse units was coded for the extent to which they realized nine different communicative functions. So in this case, the continuous situational characteristics were, were communicative functions and I'll show you an example of those in a minute. And so each text was coded for all nine of these possible communicative functions. And similar to the previous analysis, they were coded as, as quantitative continuous scales. So a, a conversational discourse unit could be achieving any one of these communicative functions to differing extents. And then finally, we use cluster analysis to identify conversational sub-registers. I'm just going to show you kind of the final results here, not just for the time, all the details, but the, the, the nine functions, communicative functions, were these listed right here in this column. So these are things like past time orientation, future time orientation, time neutral, figuring things out, situation-dependent commentary, focus on personal feelings and evaluations, joking around, giving advice, and conflict. And it turned out when we did the cluster analysis, the documents that were grouped together would be combinations of these different functions. So you can see here across the top here, these are the nine functions. And so just to take this top row here, so this is one of the, the clusters. So this is a cluster of, of conversational discourse units with a primary focus on describing and explaining the past. And that turned out to be a different cluster from the second one, which was conversational discourse units that had this primary focus on describing and explaining the past combined with a major focus on expressing personal feelings. And so you can see here we, we got this set of these, these different conversational, what we're calling conversational sub-registers that combine these nine different communicative functions to differing extents, in some cases combining multiple, multiple different communicative functions. And so then what we did in the studies, we actually then went and we looked at each of these individual sub-registers of conversation and interpreted them relative to these, these dominant communicative functions that characterize that particular sub-register of conversation. Okay, so just to wrap up, summary. To contrast the traditional versus the continuous situational perspective. So in the traditional register analysis, we begin with a general situational description of, of the register. The analyses are in categorical terms rather than continuous terms.
And the analysis gives a general overall description of the entire register. And so crucially, there's, there's no recognition of possible differences among the decks. And in contrast, the continuous situational perspective, so it's based on situational characteristics as continuous parameters. And I think a, a crucial aspect of the analysis is that each text is analyzed on its own. So each text is analyzed for its situational characteristics. And then we can look to see well, what are the characteristics of the register as the sum of those texts. So it explicitly recognizes the possibility that there can be considerable situational variation among the texts within a register. So there's no necessary requirement that all of the texts in the register are the same situation. And in fact, just the opposite, that registers can be more or less well-defined situation. So just in conclusion, the two case studies illustrated different strengths of the continuous situational perspective. So in the first case study on the register version on the web, this is based on a large multi-register discourse domain. It was not clear in that case what the register categories were. And so the continuous situational perspective enabled analysis of variation among texts within a register. It enabled analysis of the extent to which registers were well-defined or well-delimited situationally. And then that could lead to the situational text type perspective, which in turn enabled analysis of texts that do not belong to any culturally recognized register category. The, the second study, which, which I just was able to briefly summarize, the one of conversational subregisters, had different kinds of takeaway applications. So in this case, we were analyzing a large general single register. So the whole discourse domain was, was all text from a single register. But there are basically no culturally recognized subregisters within that general register. That's not quite true. You know, I think we recognize things like telling a joke or telling a story, you know, so, so there are some sub-registers, but those are not in fact very common at all within the general register of conversation. And otherwise there are really no generally recognized, culturally recognized sub-registers within this general register of conversation. So the continuous situational perspective enables analysis of well-defined sub-registers within the discourse domain and then variation among texts, in this case, the discourse units within each of those sub-registers. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you very much.